Hello all, this is Corey Lambertson with Whitmix Corporation uh, coming at you this week with uh, starting this week off with a presentation on the Verbuild 3D printer from Whitmix Corporation. Uh, so my, once again, my name is Corey. I'm sure you've seen me on these, uh, the webinars so far. We are trying a new platform today on Zoom instead of using GoToMeeting for like we'd use for our previous series. So if you have any issues or uh, questions at all, uh, you should still have a questions dialog box that you can add questions in there. Please ask them as we're going through the presentation today. And then also if you have any issues with seeing the screens or uh, seeing us, please let us know so we can get any sort of feedback so we can, so we can uh, go ahead and troubleshoot that for future presentations. Once again, my name is Corey Lambertson and we have Bryce Hiller with us. Bryce, uh, so go ahead, Bryce. Hi everyone, uh, most of you know me, I'm Bryce. Uh, I work with Corey here at Whitmix as a um, technical specialist. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you for everybody for joining us today. I think this is gonna be a, a pretty fun session. Yeah, I think, I think so too. So uh, we're gonna cover today the Verabuild 3D printer. And so this is a, a printer from Whitmix Corporation itself. How I like to start these, this, this type of presentation is I'd like to go ahead and start with, with covering what 3D printing is, the terminology behind it, the technology behind the Verabuild 3D printer. And then we'll talk a little bit about the printer itself directly to like specification performance. And then Bryce is gonna do a hands-on. So if you see over his shoulder, you can see a little peek at the printer. Oh, oh, that shoulder. Hit him with the shoulders, Bryce. And you can, um, you can go ahead and you can see that we have the printers here. So we are actually gonna take one of those printers apart so you can see how it looks internally. Uh, and then of course we have one live there just so you can see it up and running. And so if you, um, once again, if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, I do have on the screen a, a PowerPoint presentation, so please, uh, I don't want to be death by PowerPoint, but we'll go ahead and get started with it. So on here, I like to just dive into, you know, the actual schematic of digital dentistry. So uh, this is something that I pull from Three Shapes uh, Direct Manual, and how it is, is, or how this works is if we look at the left-hand side of the screen, it shows that we have to start somewhere for digital dentistry. So before you get a 3D printer, you, there's some prerequisites that you have to have beforehand. So if uh, the starting point is we have to either have an impression, a gypsum model, or a intraoral scan. From there, we're gonna go from one of those three aspects and move into a CAD software. So whether the CAD software be uh, 3Shape or if the CAD software uh, be dental wings or exocat or whatever it may be you have to have a design software and then from there after you have your design software you're going to create your stl file that's when you can get into the actual 3d printing aspect so that's where we're going to see that dive in so if you are looking to get a 3d printer but you don't have either accounts with the intraoral scanner or you don't have a an actual um, a cad software you will need that information as well so from here, I'm gonna go ahead and let's go ahead and I'm gonna dive into the next actual section. So what is 3D printing exactly? Uh, a lot of us probably know this, but it's a process of taking a three-dimensional object, digital object, and go ahead and turn it into a digital model or application by creating it with many thin layers. Uh, so I have some forms of 3D printing here and some of these are going to look familiar or different styles or maybe even different terminologies you've heard. So uh, inside dentistry, the ones that we'll see are, that are most popular is uh, FDM. So an example of that would be, I think, the Valplast style printer, right, Bryce? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So that is a FDM uh, fused deposition modeling style 3D printer where it uses a spool of material and it actually will push the material through and uh, like uh, actually extrude it like it's a hot ink bed um, and create the three-dimensional structure. From there, you also have the, uh, the next type that you'll see inside of dental technology or digital dental technology is we have the sterile lithography VAT polymerization and uh, the also photopolymeriz photopolymerization DLP. We're gonna see a little bit of a different, uh, a couple slides here where it's gonna break it down even further because this is actually what the Verabuild printer is. The Verabuild printer is a sterile lithography printer. Now there's three types of sterile lithography um, and we're gonna dive into what that is. The next type that we'll see in 3D printing down on the bottom, if you see it, it actually says polyjet 
material jetting and dispensing. That would be another form that we're going to see in digital dentistry. This is like where, uh, have you seen the like uh, Stratasys style 3D printers or some of the old uh, uh, 3D systems printers that had the inkjet cartridge or head where it would actually swipe across the print bed and uh, dispose material that way or dispense material that way. Uh, and of course, we also have the powder bed fusion, which is up at the top. So selective laser centering or selective laser melting. Uh, chrome cobalt frameworks. Uh, do you know if they're doing anything else with that type of 3D printing, Bryce? Or what, what have you seen? Um, not, not in mainstream production. I think there, there's probably um, some things in the works, particularly with maybe possibly um, 3D printing zirconia. Um, but not, not, nothing that's mainstream at this point. Okay. So this, this just kind of gives like an overview of all the different types of technologies for 3D printing, but the main ones that we're going to see in dentistry are the fused deposition modeling, uh, sterile lithography, and a little bit of selective laser centering and polyjet. So to break it down even further, there's this term sterile lithography, SLA. It gets thrown out there, you know, and what does it mean? And the actual true definition of sterile lithography is the process of solidifying a photopolymer resin layer by layer that is activated by a UV light. So if we take that information, there's actually three different types of sterile lithography printers. Uh, a common misconception is that they think that the laser type is the only sterile lithography. Uh, it's actually not true. So we have laser SLA, uh, which uses a laser-based system to actually cure the image itself. We have DLP, which would be like our uh, a Sega printers. It uses a high power DLP projector to cure the layer all at once. And then there's the new technology, which would be the uh, like our Verabuild, for example, which is mask sterile lithography. It uses an LCD mask. We're going to see that Bryce is going to show us how to actually take that apart <clears throat> today. So the main differences um, behind it all. And there actually should be one more. Um, okay, no, sorry, we only compared LCD versus SLA for DLP. So there is a third type of 3D printing that we're not going to cover in this presentation, which is the still lithography laser. This would be like the form lab style. And the reason why I didn't compare it in this presentation is because it's not a direct uh, technology similarity. It is going to be where it uses a photo, photopolymer resin to solidify it and cure it, but it uses a uh, a laser itself to pinpoint and cure. It's a very slow technology and is going to be the least accurate of the three that we're going to see or that we're talking about. Now, a direct comparison would be like LCD style 3D printing versus DLP sterile lithography. Uh, we can see how they both work. If we look at the screen with us and uh, we'll be able to see it firsthand with Bryce when he takes it apart, the sterile lithography LCD printer, it has a resin vat just like the DLP printer does. Uh, they both will have build plates and then they both have a UV light source. So the DLP uses a projector versus the sterile lithography LCD uses a high power LED light and then an LCD panel, an LCD mask itself. And that is what actually allows the light to pass through to cure the layer itself. So the main differences between the two is that the LCD printer is going to be a very low entry level cost. Um, so they are inexpensive. And the reason why is because the cost to manufacture is less. Uh, DLP is going to be a lot more expensive. The LCD printer is extremely easy to repair and inexpensive to repair. We're going to see that with Bryce today when he when he dives into one of our Vero build printers. And then beyond that, we also have the, the DLP printer is going to be more expensive. The projector on most DLP printers, you're looking at at least just for the projector alone, the light engine itself, at least five to six, seven thousand dollars, if not more, depending on which printer you have. Uh, and unfortunately, a repair of that cannot usually be carried out by a just a traditional end user, maybe a super user, or maybe a, a end user that's an engineer would be able to get through it. But it is pretty technique sensitive to do a repair on a DLP. LCD, a lot easier. Uh, there's a trade off though. LCD printer will be a little bit less time to print. Uh, or sorry, a little bit longer time. The DLP is going to be less time. Uh, DLP will be faster. And then the accuracy between the two, they're very close, but the LCD printer will be slightly more accurate than what the DLP printer is. And we're going to see that here in a second as to why it is more accurate. So 
how do we define accuracy? Uh, Fresh, do you want to cover how we define accuracy in the X, Y plane and then in the Z plane here in the next slide? Sure. So, so um, you know, there's multiple components when we're talking about accuracy. Um, like Corey just said, there, there's kind of two components here that, that really make a difference. Um, the first is going to be X, Y accuracy. So this is going to be the pixel size. Um, the, the pixel size is typically going to be a determined, uh, a determined size. Um, uh, for example, on the Sega Max, it's 62 microns. So that means uh, if you look on Corey's screen on the right-hand side, where underneath where it says DLP, all of these little boxes, all these little squares are what make up the entire projector image. It's just the same thing as your computer screen, your phone screen, your TV, everything operates in pixels. Each of these little pixels um, is uniquely either il illuminated or not illuminated. Uh, on on the the Sega Max printer and, and on the Verabuild as well, um, and uh, in this case on for the Sega, you know in the case of the Sega Max you're looking at 62 microns um, uh, X Y pixel resolution. That means uh, each side of that pixel is 62 microns uh, wide, tall, um, you know whichever orientation you're looking at. Now the Z axis calibration, or I'm sorry, the the, the Z axis um, accuracy. Um, is going to be determined by whatever resolution you choose in your nesting software. So uh, this is kind of where you get a choice. Uh, the pixel size, you can't really change. One small caveat with the Pro 4K that we're not probably not gonna get into today, but for as a general rule, you can't change the pixel, uh, the pixel XY resolution. Now the Z, X, the, the Z resolution, you can. So in your nesting software, you're gonna have the option to choose uh, whether you wanna print your objects in say 50 micron layers, uh, or 100 micron layers, or even uh, even taller. Um, what that's going to translate to is, is uh, shown on your screen right now. So on the left side, these are let's say for instance, this is an object that's printed in 100 microns. So you can see those layers a lot more clearly because you're printing them taller in each layer. Ergo, you're going to have a, a less, I don't want to say precise, but a less defined surface finish. Uh, whereas on the right hand side of your screen, that's going to be an object that's going to be printed in say 50 micron uh, um, slice thickness. Uh, so you're going to get uh, more, basically better surface detail and, uh, you know, in reality, more accuracy from printing a smaller Z resolution. Um, now, when you combine these two things, so your, your pixel resolution with your chosen uh, Z axis resolution, that's where you're getting your accuracy. Um, so it's really important when you're choosing a printer to look at both of these things. How, how thin can you print these layers um, and, and how small is this pixel size? Um, because those things combine are where you're getting your accuracy. Right. Absolutely. Thank you, Bryce, for that, that excellent explanation. So just to take it a, a dive deeper so we can see, you know, in this uh, three-dimensional object, the, the layer height, Z resolution, and how it affects the object. I do have another example for X, Y resolution. And so I hope it turns out okay with throwing this through the actual, uh, the through the webinar. But if we look at these two circles, so the example on the left was sliced or is the pixel uh, size for a uh, the LCD printer and then the object on the right is from a DLP printer and so if you look at that XY resolution the smaller the 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 tighter the pixels themselves the greater the surface quality you'll get as well and the more accurate it'll be so if you look at these two structures the object on the left it looks a lot more smoother it's a lot more accurate it's a lot more truer it's truer to the actual cylinder that we sliced for this the object on the right we can see since it is a larger pixel size it has a larger stair step effect on it which is going to create a less accurate structure it's not as true to the actual digital render of the file itself so now that we covered a that was just like a quick tutorial on 3d printing itself the technology what it is what it isn't and so from here, let's actually go into the Verabuild printer. So uh, this last year in Chicago, we released the Verabuild LCD 3D printer. And so this is a 3D printer that we went to market with. Uh, it's a phenomenal printer. It's extremely solid. Uh, and uh, let's actually go into some of the specifics of it. And so the technical specifications of the printer itself, it is a LCD stereolithography 3D printer. This uses the LCD mask in the background or on top to allow the light to pass through to cure it to the build plate, to cure the objects or create the layers. It is a open material printer. So that means you can use any 
material that's on the market. Uh, it's going to come pre-calibrated with all of the Whitmix resins and the Denka resins. And from there, if there's any other material that you want to try from any manufacturer, you're more than welcome to it, but you will have to custom tune the profiles for it. But it is completely open. Uh, it is a 405 nanometer wavelength light only. So it only will print resins that are produced for 405 nanometers. So uh, that is a topic where, let's say if I bought a resin that was specifically designed for the light spectrum at the 385 nanometer light spectrum, which is in the ultraviolet spectrum, it would not work well for the 405 printer. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever resin you buy, if it's outside of Whitmix's qualified resins for this printer, you will need to get the three, or sorry, the 405 nanometer resin. Uh, beyond that, the pixel accuracy, which Bryce touched on, is 47 microns. As a variable layer thickness, you can program it to any layer thickness you want. It's going to come pre-defaulted from Wimix with all the Wimix resins between 50 to 100 micron layers. Uh, it comes with the easy to use nesting software, Alpha 3D. Uh, Bryce is going to show that here in a little bit. It is extremely compact in size. It's fairly small, uh, which makes it really nice. And the idea that you can actually fit this under a cabinet if you wanted to. Uh, it's very lightweight as well. Uh, the build plate is 118 by 66. It comes with the Wi-Fi connectivity and it's already calibrated, ready to go. There's no calibration process with this printer. So let's talk about some of the accessories that come with it. It's going to come with the build plate. It's going to come with two extra resin vats. So the actual resin container, Bryce is going to show you what that looks like today. I think there's a resin vat in the printer. It's already filled up. Uh, we have an ethernet cable it's going to come with. So if you didn't want to use the Wi-Fi, you can hardwire it. Um, it also has the Wi-Fi dongle plugged in it. It's going to come with two extra vat film. So unlike the Asiga printer, the Asiga printer, when you buy a new vat, I mean, to be able to replace the Teflon, you have to buy a whole new vat. For this printer, instead of buying a whole new vat, you can actually just buy a new Teflon sheet for the bottom and just replace it, which is really neat. Uh, from there we have, it comes with two extra LCD screens and then a little Allen screen, or a little Allen uh, wrench, a little hex key that allows you to take the whole printer apart. Uh, so it's really easy to do and we'll be able to see that here momentarily. Just the warranty on it. It's a one year limited warranty against manufacturing defects. Uh, that's gonna be the same for any 3D printer out there. The cover components would be like the LCD uh, control board, the Z control board, Z axis control board or module, the cooling system, the touchscreen itself, uh, any sensors, etc. The non-cover components would be actually the consumables. So the vat film, the resin vat, the LCD panels and the build plate. And so just to cover that, um, oh, here in a moment. The, uh, it also comes with the Alpha 3D software, which Bryce is gonna give us a demonstration of it. It's extremely easy to use. You could probably start printing in maybe five, six clicks. I mean, it's, you could probably be printing in less than two minutes, a full mm -hmm. build plate. I mean, that's if you're not explaining the process, I think, and Bryce will be able to prove us, uh, prove me wrong, possibly. And then it is, uh, there's no annual renewals, automatic support generation. It has anti-aliasing built into it, which will increase the surface quality. And you can use any slice file. So if you want to use a different slicing engine and transfer it over, you can. And you can use any STL file, any, any STL file from any manufacturer you can actually print with this printer. So the consumables, we have two different types of consumables for this printer. Um, this can be the maintenance consumables is the first type. And I have the item numbers all listed here. That's going to be the actual resin vat frame. Now this, if you were to buy a whole new vat frame, it comes with the actual, uh, the Teflon on the bottom as well. Uh, the resin vil or the, the uh, resin vat, just the vat films themselves, you can buy that. The build plate is an extra consumable. Unless you really gouge the build plate, that's the only time that you'd ever have to replace it. Bryce will be able to show you what the ones look like that we're printing with. And you can see that they're, they look gouged up and it still prints great. Uh, and then, of course, the final application would be the LCD panels themselves. The LCD panels, it is a consumable. So unlike the DLP printer, you actually have an LCD screen that will deteriorate after about three to four months. And so uh, you would actually replace just the LCD screen itself. Bryce will be able to show you what that looks like in first hand here in a little bit. Beyond that, the next consumable items that you'll have for this printer 
it's going to be the actual resins. So what comes programmed on the printer itself is the Vera guide, our surgical guide resin. Um, all of our model materials are now available on it. So the Vera model OS white, golden brown, gray, ivory, these are all programmed for the printer itself. Uh, these model, the model material works great for fixed or removable indications as a great surface detail and it's extremely easy to post process our materials. Uh, and then the future resins, which I didn't include on the past stage, I should have, I forgot to add that slide in. The Denka denture resins, the actual, the 510K approved denture resin from Denka, the base, the tooth, and the trine material are all qualified for the Verabuild 3D printer. So that means if I wanted to start printing dentures, but I didn't want to make that big investment for, let's say, an Asiga printer or any other DLP printer out there, you can actually start printing dentures with the Verabuild printer for fairly inexpensive. The, the, I think the printer, the retail in the US is $3,500. Um, and so all the Dentka resins are qualified. Coming down the pipeline would be the Dentka Crown and Bridge resin. And also we'll be adding our custom impression tray resin as well. Uh, we'll be able to add that into the software and firmware updates that are coming in the next uh, future shortly. So pretty exciting about the Crown and Bridge resin. We just did a webinar like two weeks ago with that. That's going to be pretty wild to be able to use the uh, crown or use this printer to print temporaries, and you could almost do it chair side. I mean, it won't be immediately done like in an hour, but give it two hours or so, you could have an actual temporary ready for that patient. So pretty wild. Let's go ahead and um, that concludes my PowerPoint. Hopefully nobody fell asleep. Hopefully nobody left. Uh, and let's go ahead and let's uh, go into the actual hardware components. Bryce, if you want to go ahead and show us what you got um, and let's talk about what, what we're working on. Yep, let me just, uh, I'm gonna grab my webcam here. It's gonna go a little crazy for a second. So just bear with me because I want to get it nice and close for everyone. <laughs> There's a Zoom feature, but I'm just not convinced that it's gonna be perfect. So, okay, so I have here, uh, I've got two, uh, two Verabilds here. One of them is powered on, and this is the one we're actually going to be um, going through like the, the, the actual usage of it with. And then um, the other one here is um, the one we're going to kind of take a look at some of the guts. So let's go ahead and open this one up. And in this little bin right here, I have already taken off this little bezel that goes on top of the LCD screen right here. There are simply four screws that you remove um, and this this little this is just a little aluminum bezel that comes right off the screws i've already got set down here here's the little allen key uh, that we use it's just a it's probably i don't know maybe a, a three i don't know a three I think it's like fourths allen key i don't know i think it's like a two and a half i think it's like a two or two and a half millimeter millimeter okay yeah yeah um, so that's going to come with the printer and this is this is really for the I mean this is pretty much everything that you need right here So don't lose it if you do fortunately, it's a very common size. So uh, most most people probably have one, one of these laying around anyways um, So a few things that I want to uh, Point out here. Let me see if I can get a good angle here on my webcam So um, the build plate to remove that it's as simple as unscrewing it and pulling it right out you get a good shot of the build plate. So you can see there are some scratches on it and that's normal. So this is machined aluminum. Um, whereas like the Sega Max is, is going to be um, anodized, uh, whereas yeah. this is not. So this is gonna be a little bit softer, um, which is why it's kind of rated as a consumable. But like Corey said, you know, we've honestly, we've kind of scratched the, uh, the tar out of this thing, um, yeah. just in, in the process of trying to abuse it to test its capabilities. And it still prints uh, perfectly. Um, so, uh, you know, don't, don't worry about scratches. Um, that's really, that's really not an issue. Um, so let me set this aside here. And um, what I would like to do is kind of show you the inside of the frame a little bit. So I have, I went ahead and over here on the sides, on both side, both sides of this, this front housing, there are four screws, uh, two on each side. Uh, I went ahead and removed those and put them in my little handy dandy little bucket here. And you can actually see if I can be really awesome and do this with one hand. You can do it. I have faith in you. 
So I'm not gonna just yank the thing off because if you look down here, there is a cable that connects the main front screen uh, or the, main, the, the front panel to the main board, which is kind of like back under, under here, sort of. Um, so this front panel comes off and you can see um, that pretty much everything in here you, you could theoretically replace. So if, if you need to replace the front panel, it is as simple as removing this cable, unscrewing these four screws, uh, and basically putting the new board on and plugging it back in. It's very simple. Um, now, as for the actual uh, LCD screen, um, so this black square right here, this is the LCD screen. And this, is, this essentially works the same way as like a phone screen. Um, it's simply an LCD uh, mask that either allows or does not allow uh, light to penetrate it. The light source is actually, see if I can get a good view here, uh, under here, See if I can straighten this up a little bit for everybody. <laughs> Sorry. If I'm anybody's getting it. motion sickness, I apologize. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So under here, you're going to see this, this kind of weird looking clear glass structure. So this is actually just an LED array. So this is just a light source. This is either on or off. Um, and then the, the actual LCD screen here is what tells or, or, or where, where the printer actually decides what to print and what not to print. So right. it's gonna analyze whatever layer you're printing and it's going to either allow or not allow those pixels to have light penetrating through them from this LC or from this LED light source underneath. Now, um, one thing uh, that I'd like to show you is how uh, actually how easy it is to replace this LCD screen. So like I said, you simply remove these four screws here, 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 and here and take off this aluminum bezel. And then at this point, this LCD screen, I'm gonna have to push up on it from the bottom slightly, actually just lifts right out. Now over here on the side to change it, there's a really small little ribbon cable right here. All you have to do is just, you wanna do this gently. Just pop that guy off. Yep. Let me see if I can set this down and then give me one sec here, let me move my camera down. Oh, there it goes, sweet. Bam, look at that. There you go. So from here, all I literally all I have to do, it's kind of easier if you push up from the bottom a little bit. I'm just carefully removing this. And there's our LCD screen. So there's really not a whole lot to it. At this point, you'll just take your new one. You'll kind of feed this little ribbon cable through. You don't want to be careful with these ribbon cables. Just about any ribbon cable and any kind of electronic is going to be somewhat fragile. So right. you don't want to you don't want to like yank on it. So I'm going to set that that screen into place, and then let me see if I can get a good view, static view over here on the side. Bear with me. Let's move this bad boy down. Oh, look at that. There's a view. Yeah, it looks good. Kind of so hard to here. see. It, we can see it, but it's a little digitized. But it looks, still looks good. I think okay. we can still get the gist of what. So I'm taking this ribbon cable here and I'm just situating it in place. If you've never worked with a ribbon cable before, it, it's kind of, it's, it kind of takes some getting used to, but you'll feel it kind of sit into place on top of the port for it. And then you just very gently push it into place. You don't want to, <laughs> obviously you're not taking a hammer to this thing. It will snap right down into place. Then it will, uh, correspondingly um, unsnap very easily. So let's get that, and there it is in place. At that point, all we have to do, we're just gonna remount the front frame with the four screws, so two on each side, and then you simply remount the aluminum bezel like so. And that's it. I mean, once once you've done it once, um, it can literally take you, um, it can literally take you like like three, three four minutes to replace the LCD screen. Um, yeah. And that's something that's really, really, um, honestly, pretty unique about this printer. Um, just about anything, uh, not not just about, I mean, anything on it is user replaceable. And we actually have videos 
um, to show you how to pretty much replace anything. And I, I, to my knowledge, there is not another printer on the market that allows you to do that. So the entire yeah. goal with this thing is uh, convenience for you guys, uh, convenience for the end user. Um, we want, we wanted this printer to have basically no downtime. So, um, you know, as long as you're keeping the regular maintenance consumables uh, in, in your inventory, like the, like the screens and the resin vat films, um, it, it's, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to have any kind of downtime with this thing, uh, yeah. which is just absolutely uh, critical for a lot of labs. Um, this, if, if you're new to 3D printing, this thing makes a great first unit. It's an entry level price, um, but I can assure you the performance is not entry level. The performance is, is stellar. We put these things through the ringer um, when, we, when we started um, developing this product and uh, they really, they seriously hold up. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is if you already have some 3D printers, like let's say, you know, we've got a lot of Asiga users uh, and let's say you, you, you have an Asiga or you have a carbon and you want something for either overflow or uh, you want something to make sure you're still up and running if something happens to your main printer and you're, you're down. I mean, if, if your carbon goes down, you know, you're, you're going to be out for probably a while. Um, where, uh, or, and, and, you know, really a, a lot of DLP printers are that way because like Corey mentioned earlier, um, even like on the Asiga Max, um, you know, if, if you have to have the projector repaired on it, um, you know, it's not something that the user is going to replace. So if you have one of these variables to go along with it, you're, you're basically at no downtime. You know, you can pick right up. Uh, so this is a solid, really, really solid little unit to complement any of your, uh, any other printers you might have. So it's really perfect for just about anybody. And like Corey mentioned, chair side is spectacular because you can really pump out um, as soon as, uh, you know, as soon as we formally release the crown and bridge resin, you can pump out temporaries. Yeah. Um, so it's really a, just a solid choice for anybody. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. we had a couple questions come in. I just want to address them real quick. And so uh, one of the questions is how long do the LCD last or LCD screens last? And so these screens last uh, on general use now, it's going to vary on user and laboratory, but we're seeing an average about three to four months uh, per screen itself. Uh, and then we had another question is, how do you know the panel needs to be replaced? So I'm going to show, I'm going to pull up, we actually have it in the user manual. Let me see. Actually, let me go ahead and share this real quick. I'm going to share my screen. And so that was a good question. So how do we actually determine if the LCD screen is going bad. So let me see if I can zoom on this dude. Maybe as good as, okay, there we are. So here's an, uh, a brand new LCD screen. It's gonna look like this. And you can see in the background, the actual LED lights coming through. Um, this looks like a normal good screen. From here, uh, this next spot, it shows that there's a couple a couple little black dead spots right here and right here. So you'll start to notice that you'll get some dead pixels, they're called. And so it's like little black speckles. And as it gets, as it deteriorates further, those speckles will become larger and larger and then eventually you'll have some black holes. This is a sign that your LCD panel is overheated to the point that it needs to be replaced. Um, and so, you know, after about three to four months of use, if you start to see this, it may even be longer than three to four months. We, you know, that's just an average amount of time. And so if you start to see these dead spots on your LCD screen, that's how you can actually determine if your LCD screen needs to be replaced. Uh, and for example, Bryce touched on the video aspect of it. So if we go to witmix.com, just to show that real quick, and very, on the very front page, we have our uh, variable 3D printer right here. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And we have uh, links that go to the tutorial videos, the maintenance and repair videos, and the Alpha 3D videos. So we have videos for anything. So if I was to pull up, like for example, Fairbuild 3D printer maintenance videos, I can see that I can replace the power socket, the power supply, the system board, backlighting system, touchscreen, uh, print screen driver, print screen replacement, bottom fan. These are all videos that we have just for the end users. And so you can actually disassemble this whole machine and reassemble it. I mean, I think it would be kind of cool if we did that at a show, you know, like to yeah. show how easy it is, you know, imagine <clears throat> like having a competition where we tear it apart, put it back together, whoever builds it the fastest and it still works, <laughs> yeah. 
you know, I mean, that would be, it's something that would be, you know, you could easily do uh, and it would work. I mean, the, the printer is just phenomenal for what it is. Can you, um, Bryce, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Would you be able to show how the touch screen works and even how to show like the, uh, you know, how to like turn on the LED light and show the light coming through on the mm -hmm. printer? Yeah, absolutely. Let me, um, let me get my webcam situated here to a good shot. And while you're setting it up, okay, I think that's all the, all the questions that we have so far. Let's see here. So if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to start shooting those through. We'd be more than happy to answer them. Zoom way in here, get it nice and pixelated for everybody. Yeah, let's not do this. Hang on. <laughs> that's no good. No bueno. No me gusta. Hang on. Let's see if I can get this thing a little bit closer so it's not so pixelated. There you this? go. That looks better. Can you read it? I can't tell if you can read it. Um, we don't need to really read the the screen, but you could um, you could take out the resin vat and show, or like just say what you're clicking on, and then uh, when you get to it, you can actually go ahead and actually um, cool. Uh, like take the vat out and yeah. yeah. So to take out the resin vat, there are these little twist handles right here. Simply twist them counterclockwise to loosen, and then slide them out like so. And then this resin tray actually just lifts right out. So you can see that um, uh, you can very easily uh, purchase multiple trays, uh, resin vats, and uh, they are, it's super quick to swap those out. Uh, which is really nice. Um, that's, that's pretty critical for just about any printer. Uh, it needs to be really quick to swap out resins. Um, so this one uh, is no exception to that rule. Uh, very, very quick. Um, now, <clears throat> um, on our front panel, we have six main, uh, six main screens here. We have print, uh, we have clean, which is, uh, if you have an Asiga, it's a similar process where it's uh, it's going to basically ex expose the entire bottom layer of your resin vat, and then, uh, which will then, uh, uh, ergo, it will cure it, and then you can peel that out. And it, uh, the idea behind that is if there's any bits of floating re uh, cured resin that have settled to the bottom, or anything that for some reason didn't stick to the build plate and is stuck to the bottom of your resin vat, this is how you're going to purge that material. Yep. Uh, under network, uh, we have just basic network settings. Um, that's that's uh, boring and no need to discuss it. Um, and uh, we have uh, basically a, a log file, um, which for the most part, you're not really going to probably use all that much. Uh, we, we may use it for troubleshooting, but it's not something that's really entertaining. It's not like Harry Potter, which is fun to read. Um, <laughs> I am a Harry Potter dork. So yeah, there's that. Um, under settings, uh, we have some basic printer settings. Um, and we have a uh, firmware update screen, system update screen. Um, and diagnostics is, is kind of where, where we're, you're going to find uh, the ability to ex um, or basically show that LCD panel. Um, or I guess alternatively, you could just do it from the, uh, you could just do it from the clean screen as well, couldn't you, Corey? Yeah, so you can do it both ways. So you can do it with clean, which will then actually show the light. So if uh, if you guys are watching right now, you can see that it, it started illuminating like this blue hue from the LCD screen itself. So that's that light passing through. Now, if you go back to that uh, that service section where we're under LCD, go ahead and jump back to that after you um, go ahead and cancel this part. And then there's a way you can actually test to make sure that the LCD screen is actually functioning the way you want it to, whether it's being projecting uh, squares, rectangles, or a diamond pattern itself. So right now you can see, yeah, Bryce is actually playing with that setting now. So I believe that would be the square settings. That's all lit on. Um, okay, we have rectangle. Um, and I think there's a diamond pattern too. Yep. Diamond. Yeah, diamond. So you can see that the screen is actually functioning the way it should. So after, after you replace that screen, this is a test that I do mm -hmm. to make sure that the new screen functions just like it should and it's uh, responding the way it should. And then beyond that, you also have the ability uh, as uh, with this type of test, you can also test to make sure that the screen is not functioning the way it's supposed to. So if you're checking for that LCD screen to see if it's bad, this is where you'll do it. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward on how to use it. I think we had one more question come through. Um, 
is there a user agreement payment at first or with purchase? I heard you say no yearly licenses. So a user agreement, like there's no license for example, for software. So like for three shape, you have to pay your annual user uh, license fee. Uh, for the uh, for the variable printer, there's no service agreement that you have to pay for. Now, um, do you want to pay for a like a service level agreement where you are paying for a faster response time for for tech support, or you're looking for after hour support? We we do offer packages for that, which is separate. But for actual just initial use of the machine itself, you don't need to pay for an, an annual agreement just to be able to use it. No, no, you do not. So let's um. You want to run through the Alpha 3D software, show us yep. how to use it, and then um, if that other, I don't know if that printer is connected to the web interface, why don't we see if we can um, show how to use the, or what the web interface looks like for the printer as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. Um, so let me share my screen here. Uh, we'll go to screen three. There we go. All right, can everybody see my screen? I can. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so when you open your software, um, Alpha 3D down here on my toolbar, this is like this little purple logo. This is Alpha 3D. Um, this is the this is kind of the first screen uh, you're going to be presented with printing setup. So we're going to choose our model, which in this case is Verabuild uh, 79200. Uh, we're going to choose our material. So it's going to have all of these material files preloaded, which is nice. Um, I looks like I have in the printer currently, uh, looks like golden brown. So we're gonna go uh, golden brown here. And now we're gonna choose our layer thickness. So right here on this little slider bar, um, I have the options of 50, 70, and 100. Now that doesn't mean this is what you're necessarily limited to. Um, this is just what comes um, like predetermined um, in the printer's firmware. So let's pick 100 and then I'm going to click apply. So um, this, as you can see, this is a super, super soft user interface. There's like, there's like 10 buttons maybe. Uh, so it, it makes it really nice to easily nest in and get your print job started. Um, so uh, you can see here, just like in most 3D printing, Softwares, we have our build plate, uh, virtual build plate, and then we have our build volume uh, here. Uh, so the first thing I need to do is I'm going to import an STL file. So I'm gonna click the open. I've got baby Yoda on my desktop. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna nest a little baby Yoda. For those of you that have watched The Mandalorian, uh, baby Yoda is the best. Which it, that show's amazing by the way, if you guys it have is. not watched it. It is phenomenal. Disney Plus all the way. Yeah. Um, okay, so <clears throat> so uh, you can see it imported it directly on the build plate. Um, and honestly, if I wanted to just add my supports and go, all I would have to do is right here, this little like building right here with the, with the pillars, the columns. Uh, this is supports right here. Um, now I can simply click auto support and it's going to use the default settings and uh, apply supports to my object. Um, but the, however, there are some really cool customization options um, in the support screen. Uh, the first one being uh, the type right here. So if I click this little drop down tab, we have three different types. Uh, we have general, which is what we just saw, which are basically um, just, just pins, vertical pins, they might have a slight angle in certain areas. And then on the bottom, they've got like a little, like on the base, a little flared out area to add surface area for better retention to the build plate. Now, uh, if I, let's undo that and let's go to structure. Structure is the one I really like to use. Um, and I will, I'll show you why momentarily. So I like structure because in between adjacent uh, adjacent supports, it will add this little lattice, uh, this, this little lattice structure, which um, basically is just going to add more support to your supports. That was right. redundant, but you know <laughs> what I mean. It's, um, it's a structural integrity to your supports. Yep, yep. It's good to support your supports. Um, so anyway, I, I like to use structure uh, for that reason. It really barely uses any more resin. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be negligible 
how much resin you're going to use on that lattice structure. And to me, it's worth it. Yeah. Um, and the other one is simple. So this is pretty much going to be the same as um, the general. However, it doesn't have those flared out bases on the bottom. I don't really ever use this one, uh, to be quite frank. Uh, I use structure uh, most of the time. Yeah. Um, now, there are some other settings in here that you can customize. Uh, point size, that's basically going to, uh, and if we, ho actually, if we hover over these, it will show us. Hover there. So the point size, as you can see, based on this uh, neat little graphic, is going to increase the contact point. So, for example, let's say, um, let's say you printed this baby Yoda, and all the supports printed, but there was nothing, there was no baby Yoda, just the supports that's a pretty good indicator that you might need to increase this point size uh, because there may not have been quite enough contact um, on these little uh, uh, contact points to print successfully. Uh, elbow size, um, that's going to basically um, increase the, the width, I guess, of, of these elbows. So if you increase it, it's going to be, it's going to be a more intense transition uh, between the, uh, the top or above the elbow and below the elbow. Uh, the bottom size is basically going to be um, the size if you're using, you know, let's actually just demonstrate. Let's see if I can get a good view here. Okay, so I'm gonna be looking at this one right here. So let's increase this bottom size significantly so that it will actually show. Oops, auto support. So it looks like it did not so much on those, but on the other points. On the other it ones. Did. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Under here. Yep. Um, let's go ahead and undo that. Actually, let's go. Might not, it might just not have uh, registered since I had already supported it. Possibly as well. Yeah, so now they're a lot bigger. Oh yeah, there you go. So I just had to undo the, the original ones. Um, the support density. Um, Corey, can you explain support density? Because you can probably explain it better than I can. So just the, the higher number, the the increased number of supports will be. So it will create a, a denser population of supports the higher that number is. Now, have you come across an instance where you've actually needed to change that? Yeah, so I actually, I changed mine to on most all my prints, I usually change that to 90%. 90, 90%, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's, and, let's play with that and let's see what happens. So let's bump this up to, oops, 90. Okay, what is the one for your group? I'll probably it under here. So it didn't look like it actually made that much, I mean, that much of a difference for this one. It looks like it did throw one on the ear. I don't know if that was there before or not. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe even try try going to 100. Let's see what that does. I live my life 100. <laughs> I too like to live dangerously. I think that's what the kids are saying nowadays. Okay, so it looks like it's still about the same Yeah. for the support. And it could be, I don't know, maybe part of it's because I increased the bottom size so much. I don't know. Yeah, it could be maybe violating. Yeah. Um, so internal supports, this can be pretty useful. So you can see if I click that on, it's going to create supports um, basically in between areas of the model that may need it. So um, if you don't have this on, it's, it's only going to apply supports between the model and the actual build plate, whereas internal supports will connect inner parts of the model, like here and here. Yeah, and the reason why I like this internal support, so most companies, like the internal support, it usually just like puts like this whole block f through. Yeah. I like the internal supports from the Alpha 3D just due to the sheer fact that it keeps a small point contact size on both ends. Mm -hmm. So it makes it easier to remove. Yeah, So if it's definitely. a more delicate structure that, you know, you're trying to increase precision on, yeah. you know, or capture underhangs or overhangs, then that's going to help out significantly. Yeah. So dentures, denture base plates might be one, one instance for a dental application that you might want to use these. Um, so if you, if you nest your dentures vertically um, with the posterior like towards the build plate and then the anterior up here, yeah. in, between, in between that anterior flange and the palate, you may need, to, you may need some of these internal supports. Right. Uh, 
So, so that's, that's really the main dental application that I see. Also on surgical guides, depending on how you nest them, you may need some internal supports as well. Right. Um, the rest of these um, are, are, are pretty easy to, to go over. Uh, we have the base height. We have the, uh, the s actually the slope angle. Let's increase that to the slope angle. Yeah, let's go to see. Let's see how far it goes. Up, you can go up to 60. 60. So now I think it will apply more supports throughout the whole object. It probably will. So the a combination of the density and. So that's going to give you uh, okay. a, a more extreme angle here, right, to your elbow. Yeah. Well, no, it's it's essentially it's analyzing the surface and it's looking for more overhangs that could potentially be there. Okay. So yep. Yep. yeah. That so it looks sense. like it, it did capture a little bit more. Yeah. Something I like is um, I started using was base thickness, which is below that. So I'll put that to like, so now it's like, um, it'll actually, it'll show it. So it kind of creates a shadow base. So you know how like the Asiga composer software has a shadow. This does the same thing. Super helpful. Yeah. Pretty much any time I print something on supports, I print a base plate. Yeah, look at that. I mean, it looks yeah. just like. It's excellent. Yeah. Now, now the purpose got... of this, for those of you that maybe are new to 3D printing, um, the reason that you may want to use this is because the more surface area you're printing directly to the base, to the build plate, the better adhesion you're going to get. So these supports on their own, you know, might not necessarily have a lot of surface area, right. um, which, which means that it, you know, the less surface area you have, the less it's going to want to stick. Um, so by adding a space plate, we have more surface area, ergo, it's going to want to stick more. Yep. Uh, base thickness, uh, support height. Um, this is going to be, uh, I believe, the minimum the minimum su support height, right, Corey? Yeah, so that's how high it's going to actually lift the object off the build plate before yep. it starts, uh, or when it applies the supports. And I have noticed for some objects, um, so for example, my surgical guides, I'm going to go to nest those five millimeters away. Uh, mm -hmm. If I'm doing any sort of like a higher transparent resin or even my... Um, I have some denture teeth here that I was just playing with the variable just the other day because I just wanted to see how it looks. Um, I actually, they actually turned out better when I supported them so they're five millimeters away instead of the default two. So here's what they look like. And then the underside is really why, where the supports were is what I changed. Um, kind of hard to see, I forgot that I, I have the, that custom Woodmix logo on the background so now it makes it look like it's part of it. But the denture teeth turned out pretty good. I was surprised. Cool. Um, so that's pr that pretty much covers supports. Um, some of the other basic controls here, uh, we have scale. So right now I have a baby baby Yoda and I want to print a, a daddy baby Yoda. <laughs> so I can just import or uh, import increase the, the scale here. So now my baby Yoda is bigger. Oh, so you can see, you know, for outside dentistry, you have an application for this, yeah, you know, maybe. where you can scale it. If uh, if you're printing a a inside a dentistry an application, the scaling option is not something you want to do unless you want to create like a massive die as a sample that you had at your desk, you know, or or just a, a large scale denture for a sample once again, just I mean, just for yep. coolness. But yep. Um, so some of the other controls here. Uh, this is how we actually like like move and rotate our model. So I can rotate this bad boy to get him to get my Yoda inside the uh, inside the build envelope. Um, you can also rotate on um, on the Z axis, or I guess that's the Y axis. And then you can rotate on the X axis as well. Oh, that's actually the Y axis. Um, so uh, you can rotate. You can actually just pick up and drag him, although it, it's going to try to maintain that contact. Yeah, so it'll, where it'll, main, does. it'll maintain a Z. Have you ever used that select base option on the software? No, you know, actually, I haven't. Let me. Uh, so if you if you this. actually keep it, keep it so it's tilted. OK, so uh, with it selected, you'll go ahead and select on select base. Oops. Whoa. Sorry, it was already did. So go ahead and click on the uh, model or baby Yoda or daddy baby Yoda. Okay. 
there you go. Now select base and now rotate underneath and let's uh, click on the bottom edge there. Whoa, Bam. that's cool. I never used uh, that before. Look at that. Learning that something sweet. every day. That yeah, so sweet. this is extremely helpful. So let's say if you're importing models that are exported out, let's say in ExoCAD, or let's say you're using Mesh Mixer, where you were trying to use something that it, it didn't actually apply the way you wanted, or it didn't come in in a proper orientation, instead of trying to fight it and rotate it whichever direction, you can do the select on base and then select on the face of the object you want to be on the bottom of the build plate. Really that's cool, awesome. really cool feature and it's extremely helpful. Yeah, that's really neat. I've never used that before. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Nice. Um, let's see, what else? Finally, um, move models or use uh, special tools. So you can create duplicates. So Baby Yoda learned how to reproduce. <laughs> um, you can, And you can set a nesting gap. So it's basically going to tell the software how far apart you want to keep your objects. Um, let's see, text, um, let's put, let's try to delete all of this. Let's type baby Yoda. So you can add a label. Um, and then Z position, you can manually move the Z position. Um, basically just down. So if you wanted to make sure that this was really on the build plate, or if you wanted to move the object um, farther down on the Z axis, you can do so. Yep. Like Which so. that's helpful. Let's say if I had a really tall model, let's say if I was printing for somebody else and they're, they're new to model builder and they built this model that was like five inches tall. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and drag it down, you know, with that function. Yep. So the, the, um, the text you can see, Bryce is having some fun there. The text is a little, uh, uh, takes a little bit of time to get used to it exactly. Uh, but there is a, on the top bar, so you can see you put three texts. There's actually an undo button on the top left-ish. There you go. So you should be able to undo to the point of the text. There you go. So if you put it in a position where you didn't want it, or if you put too many, then you can undo. Sweet. And that pretty much covers it, uh, the software itself. So let's let's go over how we actually send this um, to be printed. Actually, you know, I'm going to go ahead and add my supports, even though I'm not probably actually going to print this. There we go. Okay. So we would add it a lot this time. That's okay. Um, all right, so what we need to do, uh, I need to click the save button right here. So this is how we actually go ahead and slice it up. Um, and so I can name this job, whatever I want. No, oh, I've got to go with the quote from the Mandalorian. I would like to see the baby. <laughs> All right, uh, so I called this print job. I would like to see the baby. And uh, we can choose our export folder. So the software is going to, by default, create an export folder for, for you on the C drive under 3DP data. Um, and all of these settings we should have already set. But if you want to change any of these, you can do so now. Uh, except the material. You can change the thickness. Uh, and then we're going to click Save. So now it's going to go ahead and slice it up, and it's going to export, uh, I think it's a, an IBF file. Is that right, Corey? I, yep. IBF? Yep. So an IBF file is basically, um, it's just basically like the CAM file for the printer. And while that's going, uh, I'm going to pull up a, uh, the, the actual web interface. So the way that you can connect uh, wirelessly to your printer and every every printer is going to have an IP address on it. It's on the front screen of the printer itself. Um, the IP address for this printer is 192.168. Oops, I accidentally pushed enter. Uh, .110.176. So I'll type it again just for demonstration. .168.110.176. That's going to open up this uh, web interface. So this is now connected to my printer. Um, 
And uh, you can see we have all of the same options over here on the left-hand side of the screen as I do on the front panel of the printer itself. Um, so just like if you have an Asiga, the, 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 the printer web interface, this is the same exact thing. So um, as soon as Alpha 3D, so it looks like Alpha 3D is done. So now we need to actually import that IBF file um, to the printer. And since we're doing this uh, wirelessly, we're gonna do this via this, um, this web interface. Um, so I'm gonna click on files right here. So this is gonna show us a list of all of the print jobs we have sent. Now, one thing to note uh, for, for any Asiga users, with the Asiga, once you print a print job, it automatically eliminates it from your queue. This does not, this will keep it. So this will keep, even if, you, even if these have already been printed, it's going to keep them in your queue. If you want to delete them, you simply select one and then you can click delete right here. Now to add a new one, I'm gonna click this plus button down here on the bottom of my screen. And then I'm gonna to navigate to that uh, 3, 3DP folder on the C drive. So C drive, 3DP data, uh, I would like to see the baby. And then here, here's our IBF file. So I'm going to open that. It's gonna go ahead and upload. And then while that's uploading, a, uh, a, a person asked, we had a question that came in for what are the specifications for the computer you don't want we're to know. using um, <laughs> this computer that Bryce is using. This is a supercomputer that Evan, um, our application engineer, Evan Kemper, he had custom built for us uh, for for doing uh, a process here at Wimix. the The specification is this of this computer and what is needed for the software are completely different. So. For example, to actually be able to run the software, it's recommended that you at least have an i7 processor or AMD uh, Phenom, uh, NVIDIA GeForce 830 or AMD Radeon R7 M340, uh, eight gigs of RAM, two gigs of disk space, uh, and at least on Windows operating system, Windows 7 or greater. The, that's just the recommended specs. This computer is a lot stronger than what, uh, yeah. what you have there. What you might call an overkill. Yeah, yeah. For if you you wouldn't you wouldn't spend two thousand or I think this is about two thousand maybe three thousand dollars for this computer for just the Alpha 3D software. You'd use it yep. for a CAD software uh, like Three Shape, and especially if you wanted to improve this the the time for uh, software calculations. Yep. Which is why we got it. Yep. Okay, so now we have. I would like to see the baby .ibf. And to start it, I'm going to select next down here in the bottom right hand corner of my screen. And then um, just confirm all of this information looks correct, which it should be as long as you send it over correctly. And then I'm gonna click print and it's going to start the print job at that point. And you can, you can also see on the screen, you can see that all the same functions you have on the touch screen of the printer you have on the left hand <clears throat> excuse me left hand side of the screen yep. so it shows that you can you can go to print you can go to settings you can do the clean fat function you can do all of the all the functions that you want uh, directly from that window so mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty sweet little printer i mean just to say it how it is it's pretty cool how well it works and the reliability of it the ease of it how simple it is to tear apart reassemble and so on and so forth I love these little things. I think they're, I think they're phenomenal. I mean, yeah, they're, it's a, it, you know, it really can fit a role for just about any lab or dental office. Yeah. Um, whether it's overflow or an introduction to 3d printing or, you know, it's, it's a great little unit. Uh, we had another question come through. Uh, do you know of a bite splint night guard resin available for 405? Uh, so for a hard splint resin um, that comes to mind for 405, would be Nextent, I know, has a, an ortho splint resin. However, take into consideration that if you are a dental laboratory, if you're going to be producing a splint, that material needs to have a 510K. And so at this point in time, to my knowledge, there's no uh, 510K uh, splint resin specifically for 405, developed for 405. Um, at this point in time. Now, if you're a dentist itself, you kind of have that little bit of a loophole where you can prescribe it and you have an FDA loophole where you can actually start printing that. 
but that was a good question. Yep. yep. Any other questions, please feel free to filter them in. We got about uh, two more minutes and then we'll conclude the session. Let's see here. I don't see any others coming in yet. Last call. <laughs> all, right. all right. Well, shoot. Cool. That we was answered easy. them all. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Cool. Well, I just want to thank you all again for attending uh, the webinar today. We appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we're going to continue doing the webinars. So just to uh, pull up a recap of what we have coming on this next week uh, in the digital training series from Whitmix Corporation. Today we did the Whitmix Variable 3D printer. On Wednesday, we're going to have Bryson Evan doing, uh, this is Wednesday, May 13th, the Bellis 3D integration with three shapes. So that's going to be pretty cool. You're going to see some mm -hmm. face scanning, how to get it into the design software. Uh, also on Friday, we're going to be doing the, uh, with Brandon Smith from three shape, we're going to have Evan and Bryce and Brandon, all three of them on this, uh, talking back and forth about what is new in three shape 2020. That's going to be really exciting. So you can see what cool features are out there and readily available once that software finally pushes through. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next week, we're going to do surgical guides. Week after that, it's going to be RPD frameworks. And then we're going to do some copy milling. I mean, it's going to be a next fun, uh, next fun. I think it's like five weeks that we have. So yep. if you have not signed up for those courses, please do. They're all free. Uh, they all are recorded and they are all uh, being approved for the uh, continuing education credits. So uh, thank you all for your time. My name is Corey Lambertson. And uh, thank you so much, Bryce, for, for joining in and and yeah. Do what you do best. This was fun. Thanks, everybody. I uh, hope everybody has an awesome week. Uh, sounds like a lot of labs are getting back into, uh, well, back to work. So um, that's, that's really good to hear. So I hope everybody has a great, productive week, and we will talk to you on Wednesday. Very good. Take care, guys.